We've been after that bar for 18 hours. It's like having like warm milk running through your veins or something. We have the superior resources and technology. I don't see anything! <laughs> exactly what you want! You know, I grew up in like the suburbs in New York and I think what brought me to film school in general was I had just had this insatiable love for filmmaking and, and for films in general, specifically indie horror films. You know, it's not the greatest environment when you're in the suburbs to want to be an artist, but uh, you know, God bless my parents, they were like, we'll send you to film school and SVA was the place that I knew I wanted to be. And uh, I went right into cinematography. I, first day I had a camera in my hand, a Bolex, you know, loading 16 millimeter. Um, and I, I just fell in love with, you know, the process of the camera department. Uh, just, you know, loading, lenses, you know, set etiquette, filters, gear, all of it. I just completely fell in love with it. I was uh, in a creative producing class with a woman named Annie Flacco. And she came in one day with like a bunch of postcards and, and just promotional material. And she was, you know, she kind of put it all on this big desk in front of her. She's like, I have a friend who's a producer at this great company in New York. They do horror films. Uh, and it's, you know, Glass Eye Picks. You know, the name at the time didn't really ring a bell, but all of the stuff that was in front of her was all for House of the Devil, which I had just watched by myself in my dorm room. And it completely blew my mind. I had never seen anything like it, certainly at that time. The second I saw that this was the company she was pitching, I, I needed to be a part of it. And I sat down with Brent for the first time and I, you know, I interviewed with him. He was like, listen, you know, we're going to Sundance with a movie that we just completed and we'd love to have you be the person to deliver it to the distributor once we you know, sell it. But he, his big thing was like, you have to watch the movie first. You have to like be familiar with it. So I sat down and it just, my head exploded when I watched it. I, I couldn't believe one that, you know, Tim Heidecker and Eric were in the movie, uh, that something so singular and aggressive had been accepted into, you know, the dramatic you know category at Sundance. And I, I just was so blown away by how special and unique it was. And I just knew I needed to be at this company. So I treated it like a job and I was just, I would, stay late and I would kind of show up when I, you know, super early when I didn't really need to quite be there that early. And I, I just w couldn't pry myself away from, from being an intern and being around these incredible people. I would say I was at Glass Eye uh, probably from January 2012 to maybe April or May. Uh, so it was a fairly short time. And then graduation happened and I was sort of thrown into the world. I, I have this great art house indie film theater, you know, right near my town let me go work there. At the time, everything was on 35 millimeter platters. Every first run feature you could possibly think of was on celluloid. I got a call from Brent uh, after not speaking to him for probably about a year. Uh, it, was a v it was very quick and kind of vague, but he was like, listen, I'm gonna send you an email in a couple of hours. Just, just read it and get back to me. Sure enough, the subject of the email was late phases. He basically was like, Nick Dimici, Werewolves, gonna be a great film. We need you for the entire time. And walked right up to my boss at the time and was like, I'm gonna step down from full-time position and I'm gonna go do this indie film. And they were totally supportive. My actual job on the on Late Phases was I was gonna be the second AC. I was working with a union focus puller on that movie. He was the first one to sort of sit me down and go, listen, like I know you're excited, but there's an order here. You know, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna call out what focal length we need. I'm gonna call out what filters we need, you know, swap out lenses. Uh, take notes of every single shot we did, uh, you know, what was the f-stop, what was the focal length, you know, what was the position of the camera sometimes. I had to literally measure, like, the, the trajectory of the lens uh, for specialty shots. There's a lot of, like, plates in that movie. It was very sort of structured, um, certainly intimidating, but I was just, just in love with, with the whole process. I, I was in awe. <laughs> I don't know if this was before or after, but we did a couple of music videos together. Uh, there was a little bit of a, of a kind of a music video mission project sort of happening at one point. That's how I first met James Seward, um, where I would be operating uh, while James would be lighting. Like, conceived the whole thing from beginning to any of storyboards. And then the second one we did together, uh, pretty quickly thereafter, a few months after, was uh, El Valtrex by Dr. Skinny Bones. Really, really lovely production with a great group of people, and that was sort of the first time I'd seen James kind of do his crazy rigs. You know, he would set up these cable cams and, and things like, we were working with a 7D at the time, you know, which was a very new technology. And we can kind of throw the camera around and do anything we wanted to. And really kind of got me into the mindset of like, all of, all of the glass eye stuff I do is gonna be in the woods. And I, I had done other projects for other companies post uh, late phases and post these music videos, but I was kind of still waiting for that extra glass eye call. And uh, the next one up was pranks which was Jack's uh, short film on 16 millimeter. 
you called me and I don't even think I said hello. I think I just answered the phone like, Larry? And you're like, yeah, it's Larry. And you're, I'm like, how's it going? And you're like, great, listen, my son wants to make a movie on film and we need you. You, you want to do this movie because my son is going to do great things. And I was like, absolutely sure. Like 100%. And at that point I had seen Riding Shotgun. I had seen like other things that he had done as a student. And I was, I mean, I was very impressed. And I was like, this kid definitely has like a tone and a style. Uh, so yeah, you're like, I'll, I'll pay you in cash. And I was like, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think maybe a few weeks later, I go up to Glen Addy for the first time, and it was like going to camp, and it was like, and for more or less, it was a kind of a microcosm of how all of the Glass Eye movies I had done since Pranks were like, which is basically you kind of set up camp with these people and make art. And uh, it was such a lovely shoot, and we had the Aton, which was this wonderful 16 millimeter camera from Europe. Uh, it was very nerve-wracking, uh, you know, that was the first time I had done anything professional on film, like shooting film. Uh, I was just loading on that, I think Chris was focus pulling, and then you were DP, and uh, it was just a lovely experience, and it was, it was just so great to, you know, we played charades at night, and I was terrible at it, and, uh, and then after that, uh, almost immediately, I got a call for Straight Bullets. I read it and I was like, this is great. I mean, I was laughing out loud on the train and I was like, I was just like, this is real. this is like a, like a, an adolescent reservoir dog. Like I, I love what this is going to be. So most of that, I am credited as the second AC on that movie. Uh, but Chris, I think at one point or another, it was late in the shoot, was just sort of like, you know, hey, you want to take this scene and just hands me the remote. And it's, it's a huge scene with Kevin Corrigan in the middle of a park with a gun and there's, it's about to, it's about to rain, we have Brian Spears like doing this, this blood gag and I'm like, okay. And this is the first time I'd ever, you know, done anything, especially on a, a, an actual actor I recognized. Uh, and for better and for worse, that was kind of when I sort of learned what focus pulling was all about. When you watch the actual scene, I mean like, it's, it's, all, it's all over the place, it is. It works for what the scene is, because I believe it's the climax of the movie and it's like, I mean, Kevin, I believe, was shot at that point. His character is, like, bleeding. And there was no rehearsal. It was just, like, grab it. And, you know, yeah, there's definitely buzzes all over the place. So, you know, I did, more or less, I mean, I, I don't want to say this, but I will, it's been so long, I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, I, so, yeah, that was the first scene I ever really pulled focus on for any theatrical glass I film. I get the script for Like Me, and I was completely knocked flat by it and I was like who is this guy that's, that wrote this insane piece um, and really maybe two weeks later I'm in Rob Mockler's apartment in Brooklyn with James uh, and you walk into Rob's place and it was just wall to wall like magazine clippings of like girls with licking bats and like this really crazy crazy like hyper stylized hyper colorful sexualized imagery that kind of looked like you walked into like you know a tumblr page or something like Me was the beginning, it was kind of, for me I look at Like Me as graduation sort of as far as like the camera department. That was really when I kind of proved myself to I think everyone around me that like I can handle pulling focus with the utmost care. And what was cool about Like Me though, uh, other than just pulling focus every day, was that there were big scenes that needed two or three cameras. So I was able to operate one of them while usually Ben Duff uh, would operate the other one while James would do the A camera. You know, because that was a very challenging shoot. Um, just using two cameras and having a full set of lenses was something I had never really done before. And, you know, after that, it kind of set up my working relationship with James Seward and also kind of announced me as an arrival of an AC that, you know, I can do this on every production, no matter what we're using. Uh, so after Like Me, um, I basically got a call from Jen Wexler. You know, she's like, I'm working on this punk horror film. And, you know, when the time comes, I'm not quite sure when, but we're looking for funding, we'd love to have you there. And I got the script and I immediately fell in love with it. We, st we did like the first two or three days in Brooklyn in the city. And then after that, we, in typical glass eye fashion, went right up to the woods and stayed in like a cabin in like, I think it was the Kingston area for the rest of the duration of the shoot. And uh, that was a real step up because we, I went from like the A7S on Like Me to the Alexa Mini. Violators will be punished. A real camera body, this is great. You know, and we had uh, Canon cinema lenses, which are, you know, they weren't as sophisticated as other ones I've used, but they, they had this very sharp, clean look um, that I think kind of accentuated the, the sort of punk aesthetic she was going for. Sure. Okay, and action. You know where your other friends are? <laughs> They're scattered all over here. There's part of one just over there. 
but we got through it and we, you know, we all loved the movie. I didn't go to South by Southwest for that one. Uh, because at that time, at the exact moment that we went to South by for that movie, we were doing Depraved. Uh, Jesse, I'm filming you if you want to oh, <laughs> try to be a little more graceful. <laughs> uh, don't worry, I'll say day two on the... <laughs> but it was very, it was very, the most, at that time, the most traditional film set I had been on as far as like the structure of it and not just grabbing things for the sake of it and... Just watching you author these performances by these incredible actors, uh, it was just, I, I got lost watching the monitor half the time. You know, I really was captivated. I just had such a great time on that movie. Um, and it, for me, it was sort of like bringing back all of the all-stars of, of the past movies that I had done. Like, you know, Chloe Levine is back for a couple of scenes. Addison's back for, in my opinion, the best scene in the movie. I mean, it was just really really incredible to see it all come full circle josh leonard who i had never worked with but i know was in bitter feast you know i had seen him in all sorts of stuff while i was an intern um it was really really incredible to just be a part of it so after depraved uh you know about a year went by and then i get a text from you uh it got me very very excited because I, I always knew that jack was working on another movie after stray bullets and then it was going to be very ambitious and it was going to be a war all i knew it was, it was going to be a war movie and I get a call from you and Jack, and you, you know, I kind of thought you just wanted to like touch base, but it was both of you, and, I, and you both kind of sounded alarmed and a little dejected. And I was like, "How's it going?" And you're like, "You know, listen, our, our initial DP dropped out. You know, do you know anybody?" And I was able to get you in touch with a guy I had just worked with, uh, a DP named Colin Brazzi, who was uh, at that time one of the, the friendlier DPs I'd ever worked with. Um, just had a very, very level-headed sensibility. And I put you in touch with him, and I think within the next day, you texted me like, you saved the movie, thank you! And he was the one that ultimately ended up doing it. And uh, I want to say like two weeks later, I was up at Glen Addy, and Colin had been there for already a week uh, doing storyboards and just mapping out the whole thing with Jack, because we were shooting, I think, just in a giant wedding tent out in your backyard. And what was really cool about that for me, like, it was to this day one of the rarest treats I've ever gotten as an AC, was that we had three sets of lenses for all three sections of the film. The first section was Elite Anamorphics, yeah, this is Cook Anamorphics, and next one we've got, uh, I think it's Airy Ultra Primes, which are spherical. So I think the first section is the Civil War, and we had uh, Anamorphic Elite lenses, which are like huge bulk, I mean, they look like zoom lenses, like a, pri a 35 millimeter prime, which would normally, you know, for a K35 is a yay big, was about that big. And I remember calling Colin that like, listen, like there's no second AC on this, it's just me. When you want to change a lens, it's going to be like five minutes. What a big lens you have, Jesse. Thank you, man. <laughs> um, but they look great and they, they were such a pleasure to pull on. I, it does happen occasionally, I have been on movies like this, but this was the first one I had been on at the time that the director, Jack, uh, insisted that he operate. And Jack has this very like intuitive way of operating, he doesn't really call out what he's going to do. You kind of, it's on you as an AC to sort of be at the monitor all, at all times when he's got the camera in his hand. Like wherever he's gonna go, like like ride it. It's kind of, it's kind of like operating in and of itself. You have to just sort of feel out what this person's gonna do. You know, you have these actors like you know giving these crazy monologues and crying and getting very emotional and they're talking about these very heady things, and you have Jack like you know right there with a hundred millimeter lens in his face and it's it was just a very very singular experience that I, I really cherished. Crumbcatcher, Chris Gostopol's directorial debut, which I had I had fallen in love with that script years prior. I had seen the script probably since 2018. Uh, so the shoot got pushed until things were safe enough to do it, and then we go ahead and go upstate, and we shoot uh, Crumbcatcher. And that was cool because it was Rigo acting, and uh, it was a DP I'd never worked with before who was this you know, lovely guy named Adam Carboni. And uh, yeah, it was just a really, really kind of return to form for you know, single location movies, and, and I hadn't really done anything like that probably since Like Me, where we're just kind of trapped in these small little rooms together. And uh, we had a really, really great in at Panavision, and we had, I, I want to say we had 18 lenses. Uh, we had like two massive zoom lenses and like I think 16 prime lenses, um, and this Panavised uh, red Gemini camera. And it was lovely. I mean, pulling on those lenses, those are the best in the world. I mean, the, the biggest movies ever shoot on those. So it was like, oh, what are we doing today? Like, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was a great time. And just seeing John Sparadakis again after Stray Bullets and seeing Rigo kind of do his thing with him and Ella. 
I mean, just a really, really fun group of people. So I think it's this month that marks the 10th anniversary of uh, meeting you for the first time and being at Glass Eye as an intern. And I mean, to put it in so many words, like Glass Eye changed my life. It, it, I have a career in film because of Glass Eye. And yeah, it, it really did shape who I am as a filmmaker and as a storyteller and as a camera assistant. I, I have made more friends at Glass Eye than I ever have in my entire life. I think I've just had such a beautiful life experience post-college because of this incredible company that looked at me and believed in me.